uh, very nice. Yes. Uh, so welcome for the like semi-annual talk on the new Java version, which is Java 21, which has been released like if I'm not mistaken, uh, like four hours ago or something. So the topic is really hot and fresh. Okay. Uh, very nice. So who am I? Uh, my name is. Uh, if you don't speak Polish, don't worry. My name is Piotr Przybył. Uh Yes. So these are my social media. If you suffer from like uh, not enough people to follow, so you can follow me on Twitter or on Mastodon. I am working as a software gardener. If you don't know who software gardener is, it means you should read a book called Pragmatic Programmer. And I'm also like Test Containers Community Champion. There, there are like a few people, like I don't know, like 20 or something, with this award or whatever it is. And I also work as a trainer. I mean, speaker, I speak here, and I also train people for money. Uh, yes, if you want to read something more from me, you can, more, or you can, you can go to my uh, personal webpage called softwaregarden.dev. And in case you haven't noticed, I'm talking really fast, right? It might be too fast for you. So if you think I'm talking too fast, just raise your hand and say, slow down, please, like cool down on everything. And the reason why I'm talking fast is this. <clears throat> we schedule this for more or less like two hours. Okay, and yet, like two hours is not enough. I know this. Okay, so we've decided we have to skip some parts. So, uh, if if you if you haven't been here like uh, half a year ago, uh, what's going to happen today? We are going to skip some parts which have been discussed half a year ago and which are recorded. They are on YouTube. You can go to like my web page. There are the rec recordings about almost every Java version, right? And you can like find it because today's talk is going to be kind of like a diff. Okay, so we're gonna focus on the things that changed, okay? I, I would still try to do like a small intro, but we won't dive deeply into the same topics that we did, did half a year ago because there's new stuff to cover, all right? So this is me uh, when I'm on holiday, provided there's a holiday, uh, Java is still somewhere like behind me, and it's been there for like uh, 20 years, I guess. So uh, more or less like this. Question is, who are you? Java developers. Oh, almost everyone in the room. Non-Java developers? Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, I, I guess I will have something for you. Okay, among Java people, who's running Java 21? Okay, kidding. Java 17? Yeah, very nice. Java 20? Okay, just one hand and still like shaky. Okay, that's not good. Java 11? Java 8? Oh, poor souls. It's Java, 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 Java 7, I, I don't, I, I dare to ask. Java 7? Nobody, or oh, you don't dare to answer. Okay, cool. Uh, very nice. Little warning. Everyone can make a mistake. I can also make a mistake. Uh, I'm not immune to making mistakes. Usually, because I talk fast, uh, I've been sick recently uh, and whatnot, so I can like slip different things out of my tongue, uh, like put random words that don't fit the context, so it's not the words that... Like, it's me, like, no, don't worry, okay. All right, Java 21, it was released, sorry, it's like, I should say, it's released today. It has 15 jabs. 16 jabs have been planned, but Shenandoah didn't make it. One of the jabs related to Shenandoah, and there are release notes. So you can go here, you can, you can open this uh, lovely link, and you see the whole release notes, right? And the, 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 the purpose of this talk is that you don't have to read this like from the very top to the very bottom, but instead you can just stay here, chill out, like sob something, and then I hope to bring you up to speed in two hours, more or less. Right? So these are the JEPs. As you can see, there are I mean these are the seven JEPs, right? Some are some are in the in, in preview, like we have string templates, uh, new fun uh, stuff. Uh, we have still like uh, ongoing previews of other things. We have like production ready uh, stuff. Right, there are, of course, like the, the big thing that came today is the virtual threads, right? And other things around virtual threads, there's virtual API, sorry, virtual vector API still incubating. And there are some things deprecated and the structure and concurrency in preview. So this is it, right? There, there, were, there was the, uh, there was the, uh, uh, the release notes. Uh, so thank you very much. I can enjoy the evening. Uh, of course, I'm trolling. Yeah. So before we go to technical stuff, there's this question because I, I saw only one hand raised for Java 20. And then you were waving for Java 17 and 11, and I guess there's nobody running like uh, Java 15 or 16 or something like this, right? So the question is, shall I abandon the latest uh, LTS and st uh, stick to the newest Java version? And I spoiled it, right? Because my answer is, what's, what's your answer? I would say I think so. 
All right? Okay, it may say depends. Okay, let's decode this, uh, this LTS, what the uh, S stands for. Okay, so S stands for support. Very nice. You got jellies. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, S stands for, come on, support. Okay, that this S is support. Question, are you paying any company for, for the support? Exactly. If you don't pay for the support, I mean, why the heck are you staying with LTS? Why do you need extended support if you don't have any? I mean, extended zero is still zero. Come on. Library version uh, I okay libraries so that's why is this this thing so unless you have really good excuse not to okay so if there's like kid dependency and there's no new version and it won't work with like uh, like new version of Java because reasons then of course you're stuck and I'm sorry for you okay but if it's not the case I think you should be surfing the wave or the of the latest Java because there are many many improvements uh, even to the main, minor versions right uh, because LTS or non-LTS, uh, to be correct, doesn't mean banana soft or monkey soft or like inferior version or version that we shouldn't care about or anything like this. It's still valid, robust, tested version of Java. It's just it doesn't have this S for which we, you don't pay anyhow. Uh, yes, so what do we have? In short, new language syntax because uh, we have like the standard and preview features. We have, of course, the hot smoking stuff uh, in concurrency. We can now process data uh, in an easier way, especially if the data comes as records. Uh, there's still ongoing stuff with native stuff. And there are, there's a bunch of other um, changes like ZGC, uh, sequence collections. Uh, we are sunsetting Windows 32. And loading uh, and agents dynamically will issue a warning. But we'll get to that. OK, so is anyone using preview feature? OK, come on, folks. You should be. OK, this one guy. Right. OK, cool. Um, it, it boils down, I mean, we've, we've going to see today some preview features, okay? And in order to use a preview feature, you have to go for a dash dash enabled preview for your compiler, for your Java, for JShell, uh, basically everywhere. And maybe it's not a good idea to run it in production unless you manage the production, okay? I've seen such cases, uh, because, uh, for example, in Java 17, some people were running it with enabled preview because they were desperate to get uh, pattern matching because it was already there as a, as a, as a uh, preview feature, and it was available because LTS and whatnot, right? So how do you set it in Gradle? In, even if you want to play uh, like with today's code, you have to go for like this enable preview, like here, here, and of course for, for running, also for test, mind you, right? Uh, in Maven, the story is quite similar. You just toss it like here and there, wherever it's needed. Sometimes it's needed to manually check it in IntelliJ because I don't know why sometimes it like chokes or something and doesn't have the, the preview version set but sets like the no preview, okay? So sometimes there's, I don't know, like a glitch or something. I, I wasn't able to re reproduce that, but sometimes it happens to me that I have to go and inspect that manually in project settings. All right, if you want to know more about project, uh, enable, uh, sorry, enabling preview features and how they work in, in the like a class uh, code level and whatnot, like bytecode, you're more than welcome to, to listen to this funny guy. Uh, I miss, at least I, I've been told he's funny. Okay, concurrency. What issues do we have with concurrency? The platform or OS threads can be slow to create. Back in the day, we were forking our processes if we had to do something concurrently, right? Because we had like many CPUs or something like this. And then we figure out forking a new process is difficult. It is even more difficult to have this inter-process communication because we need to have like a proper in-memory structure or do it like via Unix sockets or something. Tedious, cumbersome, so maybe we should go for threads because threads are faster, managed by operating system. All threads are in, 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 inside the same program, share the same memory, right? So, so no magic needed uh, and everything is simple. However, they also come in limited number because we, we can't create threads endlessly, right? There, there, there are limits. In the like because of the operating system, because of the uh, amount of memory we have, and other reasons, meaning that there is a cap in there. Okay, and to 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 like bypass the issues created by this, because we we can have like a new thread per request. Uh, the uh, our our uh, like community invented the reactive stack. Okay, so now we can go for reactive thing. However, who can troubleshoot and debug reactive stack? Wizards <laughs> without IDE. Wizards only, okay, no wizards today. Uh, it seems that Yarek is not with us, okay? So 
we just assume it's not so easy to, to, to I mean, when, when, if things go smoothly, it's okay. Once there are some issues, we have issues, okay? And we also don't have any async await like uh, JavaScript people have. And maybe we could have something like this, like a new idiom for Java, okay? So here they come, future threats, and people are scratching their heads and asking them themselves this question. Is this the biggest chance since Lambda in Java 8, right? And some people say, yes, this is the biggest change to Java, bigger than records, bigger than sealed classes, bigger than uh, like uh, low post uh, garbage collectors and stuff like this. And some other people say, bullshit, it's not true. Some say it's even bigger change. It's the biggest change since Java 5 and, and generics, some say, right? Uh, and we shall see, we shall see, I mean, in the coming weeks, months, and years, we shall see if that's the case. So, uh, virtual threads are now standard feature as of today. Uh, implementation of JEP 444, right? You can, you can click uh, these JEP links. I really encourage you to do that. Uh, yes, and I love these uh, sections which say uh, what were the goals, which also say what wasn't the goal, right? And the, down there at the very bottom, which I also like, are these, uh, okay, it's not in this one. In other ones, there are, oh, okay, it's here, still here, alternatives. So we didn't do something because, and here goes the list of reasons, right? If you think that you are smarter than these folks and you have alternative solution, may, maybe you should first go to uh, alternatives be, before you start, like, trashing on Twitter, Facebook, or whatever, okay? So... Virtual threads are great for debugging, because they are threads, switching, right, because they are quite lightweight, uh, they're good for waiting, and they're good for reducing memory consumption. Why? Because these threads are virtual threads, okay, they are not regular threads. They are threads in terms that they implement Java lang thread, but they are not Java lang thread, they are, they are virtual threads. And how do they work? They work more or less, I mean, I, I know I've been using this and we had some discussions about this, but let's assume you have taxis, okay? When it, let's say you, you decided to come here with your own car. If that's the case, the car is parked outside, right? You had to pay for it, for the car. the car. The car is still occupying some space, right? And nobody else can use it, so we could say it's not optimal resource utilization. So another option is to call taxi or call Uber and come here using like car sharing and then like you get out from the car you just come, come here you spend nice time with, with with friends like listening to this boring presentation and after we're done you're gonna have to call them again or summon uber or another ride and then you're gonna call the resource to get you back like or like to any other location because maybe you, you decided to go for an after party or something okay so this is how virtual threads work they sort of like passengers in taxis or Uber or something like this. Whenever you need a ride from A B, sorry, point A to point B, uh, magically a resource shows up, which is a platform thread, right? And the platform th thread is like a taxi or Uber, and it takes you from point A to point B, point B. And when the point B is also like whenever you have to wait for I/O, network, file operations, uh, right? So usually it's like also calling like microservices, databases posting something to message brokers and whatnot. That's an I.O. And then you just get our your virtual thread get out, gets out from the taxi, right? Does its stuff, like to, not to waste the resource. And after it's done, after the I.O. is done, then it calls for a, for a taxi and the taxi comes and takes it like to another place, right? This is how they work. So they are nice because we're not reinventing the wheel. They are still implementation of Java Lang thread, okay? So whenever you have an API that, requ that requires to have like a virtual thread, uh, a virtual thread is, sorry, a thread, virtual thread is still a thread and it will fit in this place, okay? Uh, and under the hood, they're carried just like I told you by the platform or operating system threads. Uh, they're cheap to start, they're really, really cheap to start and the, the, the memory, I mean, the, 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 the stack or chunks of their stack, shall I say better, because this is how it got implemented, lives in a heap, okay? Which also means, uh, sorry, yeah. When they're waiting for I.O., we're unmounting the carrier thread, the, the, the platform thread, and they always demons with normal prio, and they allow thread per request nicely because we, have, we can have like hundreds of thousands of them and maybe even more. And with debugging troubleshooting, and they improve scalability for asynchronous code uh, because the code behaves asynchronously, okay? Uh, I mean, whenever you're waiting for I.O., 
your virtual thread unmounts platform thread, so it's not blocking CPU core. So the CPU core can do or serve like or basically host uh, another virtual thread, right? And then after you're done, uh, you you get assigned hopefully uh, like a, a core or a platform thread, something like this. Now, if you want to switch to virtual threads in your project in your application, there's no magical switch. Okay, there is no like push the button, baby. So now all the virtual, all the threads uh, become virtual threads. You have to go to your code manually and, and, uh, and change the source code to tell, hey, now here instead of creating a thread or executor or thread factory, I need to have like a virtual threads created for me. Unless you're using like a library or framework that can do that for you. And for example, uh, Spring uh, Boot since uh, version 3.2, if I'm not mistaken, can already do that for you. You just set a flag that you, for threads, use virtual threads, and that's it. Okay, you, you, you flip like for, for, for true, and then Spring will smartly use virtual threads for you, whatever they think. I mean, the, the sorry, what's the name of the company behind Spring right there, right now? Like, it's, it's not people, to, VMware, right? It's like the, the changing the names every two years, I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, so we have to change the, the, the source code, just like they change the name. <coughs> sorry. <coughs> and this is how you create a virtual thread. You just go to thread or virtual, this is runnable, and, and you hit start, right? And in case you need to set like a name or something, of course you can use this Fluent API builder pattern, right? And create, like add something, something, uh, and then you get, you just hit start, right? If, you, if runnable is all you need and you just want to start this, the, the thread, the virtual thread, this, this is what you do. Okay, we just go start virtual thread with, with this runnable, and, and there you go. That's a thread. Uh, if you need executor, it's uh, executor's new virtual thread per task executor. And uh, if you need a factory, this is how you create it thread or virtual factory. Simple as that. Yes. This might be one of the most important slides in this uh, talk. Virtual threads won't magically squeeze more juice from your CPU. So if you have an application, which is like a regular single thread batch operation, for example, right? It won't work faster just because you switch the single thread to be virtual thread, okay? Because there is no CPU gain. The gain is like when you have to wait for something, usually IO, you don't, you don't waste your CPU cycles waiting. That's the gain. So if you have like heavy IO, heavy network, uh, something like this, then switching to virtual threads makes sense. Uh, if, you, if you spawn tons of threads because they are lightweight and, and switching easily between each other, uh, it, 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 it can also make sense. But if you have just a, like, a, let's say, eight threads or four threads running from the very beginning to the very end of the application, I really don't think switching to virtual threads will, will uh, do any good. I mean, if, if there will be a noticeable difference or improvement. Yes, so these virtual threads are no GC roots. Makes sense. If you're supposed to have a million of virtual threads, adding them as virtual threads would basically bring your GC to knees, right? That's why they are not uh, GC roots. However, there are more work for GC because their chunks of the stack live on heap, okay? So therefore, like when this, this thread is stopped and whatnot, uh, even when it's parked, unparked, they, they copy the chunks of the, of the stack threads. Uh, to, to the heap, there's like very sophisticated sort of like linked list uh, structure uh, and whatnot. And it also like depends or behaves differently depending like if the GC saw it already or not. It's very sophisticated engineering. Um, they don't guarantee first CPU usage. Okay, so just because you came here by taxi, when you, when you call taxi again, it's not guaranteed the taxi will come and pick you up. Okay. And we've painfully learned that after big games or after concerts or something like this, right? There's no guarantee that the taxi will show up and, and, and uh, like take you somewhere else just because, I mean, you're the, like a frequent uh, client or whatever that is, okay? I mean, unless they have like some, some algorithm, I don't know, like they, they prefer like these clients, but this is not the case for virtual threats. And because of fork joint pool and living in user space, CPU cache misses are possible. Meaning, just because your virtual thread unmounted for like, I don't know, a millisecond or something like this, when it's mounted again, it's not guaranteed that it will be mounted to the same carrier thread. It may end up on a different carrier thread. 
which usually means a different CPU, which means so, uh, sorry, different CPU core, which usually means cache misses. Okay, so reading like further and further from the cache or, or RAM. So if you have like a, a lot of flipping in in these virtual threads, I mean mounting and mounting, mounting and mounting, you know, like a zip zap, zip zap, then actually you might pay like a performance penalty. Okay, so it's. That's why I said, and that's why I think there is this no magic button to switch to virtual threads. Because certain scenarios, certain flows are good for virtual threads, right? And the opposite. In certain situations, you would rather not use virtual threads because then your performance may actually, or, or your throughput or something may go down, all right? So what you shouldn't be doing with virtual threads? We shouldn't reuse them, okay? They, they're cheap to start, they're easy to start, and they're quick to start, so every time you need a virtual thread, you just create a virtual thread, and that's it. That's why this executor has its, in, in its name a new thread per task. So whenever you have a new task, right, you, you should have a new thread. We shouldn't also pull them. So pulling virtual threads is, is, is not a way to handle back pressure, okay? Now we have to use something else from uh, Java concurrency. I mean, Yarek two weeks ago was like, showing us some logs or something, and this is exactly the stuff we should be using if we want to handle uh, back pressure or like pulling uh, using virtual threads. Uh, what also we should be doing is pinning them. And what's pinning a virtual thread? Pinning a virtual thread happens when you leave the taxi, but you say, you tell the, the driver, keep the en stay here, keep the engine running, I will pay for that, okay? Which means that you have to pay for that taxi, not roaming around the city, and that uh, basically, in a way, we're wasting a resource, right? Because the taxi or the CPU core isn't driving anybody else, right? So when does it happen? When you normally, virtual thread should unmount for I.O. But when you do I.O. inside synchronized block, or a native call inside synchronized block or method, then we say it's pinned. And if it's there for more than 20 milliseconds, uh, we might see that uh, in, uh, in the output from our program, provided we, we uh, use as a flag JDK trace pin threads, and full will give you like the full stack trace. Uh, and it will, it will also emit Java Flight Recorder events, right? So when you're mig migrating your stuff, you want to make sure that you're not pinning virtual threads, okay? That somewhere there's like a leaked synchronized or something. We've also learned like two weeks ago that using synchronized is not very wise uh, when it comes to performance. Right, so maybe it's better to use reentrant locks instead, and and so on and so on. Uh, that, so I did that. I showed that like uh, six uh, months ago. Uh, so I'm not going to show it again. Basically, what you can do, you can like what I recommend doing. Uh, you can pack your system inside um, inside a, a, a container using test containers. Right, you you can have, then have an, the, these other dependencies your system is calling. Uh, right, like database, like file system, external uh, services, and then uh, between them you can put toxic proxy and let's say have a like extra programmatic latency. And then uh, instead of having this round trip uh, like near zero time, uh, almost instant, you have like for example in this very example like around half a second. And that guarantees that if you are trying to use I/O instead <coughs> inside the synchronized block, you will get this thread pinned. And there's a whole link to my uh, blog, how, how we can, I mean, if you don't want to watch the video, you can go and read this uh, article. It explains you step by step the whole reasoning. So if you want to switch to virtual threads in your, in your application, and it's kind of like maybe not super legacy, but like already like uh, some, I mean, a few years or something, uh, I suggest you, you, you take a, this approach. Uh, and I want to show you like a few other demos. Gosh, the time is running. Uh, what demos do you have? What demos do you have? Uh, we have like this thingy. Okay, and I should have. Okay. So, we have some tasks to do. Okay, and this is my main method. And first, I'm gonna do this in. A, uh, I'm gonna do them as a as a in a in a stream. Uh, basically in parallel stream because this is my stack and my uh, sorry my thread and my thread uh, my task and my task is this I'm handling a task 
blah, blah, blah. And then I increment the number of started tasks and I say finished to log it. And then I have this task uh, done. And it means that the task is going to take like five seconds because you see I have this thingy, right? So it's like uh, doing hard work for uh, a second five times. So the task is going to take five seconds, uh, more or less. And instead of doing them sequentially, I, let's say I, I can use a parallel stream like we did since Java 8. You see, I create a new thread in this uh, new approach, which is going to be platform thread uh, as a daemon, right? I'm going to name it stream one, and I'm going to say it started. And then for 100 uh, integers, okay, I'll, I'll, I'm going to try to, to run as many tasks as I can. So I'm just hoping I will be able to run 100 tasks. Uh, but so we'll see how many tasks we can, we can get. And that's it. And so this is the uh, streamed task, uh, right? And I'm slipping here for six seconds. And then I uh, finish, right? Because this is a daemon thread, right? It, will, it won't block my execution. So if I have something like this, uh, what do you think? How many tasks will I be able to finish? How many tasks you have? 16. About 16 tasks. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let, okay. Yes. As Kojoyek pointed out, it depends on my um, hardware setup and also some other settings, right? Because um, because uh, parallel streams are using fork joint, for joint pool, okay, under the hood. So let's try to run this thingy. Let's hope it works. Work. Okay, so I finished just 16 tasks, right, because I have 16 cores. Um, therefore, I, I mean, it was this, uh, if we, if we, even if we take a look, see, this was this stream one thread processing one of the tasks. And other 15 were basically these uh, workers from a uh, common pool or forging pool, right? And because doing it or handling a task takes more or less five seconds, and we waited for six seconds, it means after more or less five seconds, these 16 were done, and another 16 were taken. That's why we have another 16 started. So in total, we have 32 started and 16 finished, right? Makes sense? Okay, let's try to double this number. How can we double this number? We can basically, where is the code? Sorry. Uh, what we can do, I mean, if this parallel stream can handle 16 tasks, maybe we can have 32 tasks handled because I have another parallel stream, this time stream two, doing exactly the same only from 100 to 200, so we have different numbers, so we can like infer something from the logs, okay? So let's see, I mean, how many tasks will we finish in six seconds now? 16, people saying same. 30, who says 32? Nobody? Okay, let's see. Let's see. Seventeen. It's not the same. It's not 16. Why 17? Because we added this stream two, right? So right, one of the tasks will have stream two. See, that's the reason. So we have for every invocation like this, we will get only one uh, thread like this. And of course, uh, we can also see uh, that some tasks like see 175 was from this pool, right? Not from this pool. Okay. So that's why I have this sleep 10. If we waited 10 seconds here, or like even like two seconds, okay, that would mean that this uh, every, everything would be saturated uh, by this stream, uh, and then there will be no workers left for this stream. And now we see like this also and this. So basically, they, they split right the the underlying fork joint pool. So this is how they work. So now we may decide to instead try virtual tasks. Okay, so we have like virtual threads, and uh, if you've seen like one of my demos previously, you know I can easily start on my machine like a million of virtual threads in my current setup, and I didn't change my CPU, I didn't touch my RAM uh, drive and anything. So what do you think, how many tasks will I be able to finish this time? All, probably. All of them. Okay, let's see.
And 15. We started 32 and we finished 15. Because the corporation, the taxi corporation or the taxi company is called fork joint pool. Okay? So this is the this is the trick. So under the hood, okay, I, I, I can't have as many taxis as I can as I want in my in my in my city or in my town, right? In the streets. I again have to use the company called Fork Joint Pool. Okay? So um, but maybe we would love to see like how how the, these tasks progress, okay? But we because we have only finished here as info, and if we go here and here this handle task, you can see that I report the progress. So this is stage one, st or like step one, step two, and so on till like uh, yeah. So this is info, and this report is using like uh, logger fine. So the like one of the it's like a debug in Java logging, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set the log level to fine and we're gonna see like how they progress okay over time because this time we got 15 tasks completed so let's see how many tasks we'll have completed this time okay after we increase this uh that so we, we have more precision looking in this log what what, what happened all righty and see uh okay uh whew. it says it says bad things. First, I don't have this fine, so I, I, I know less than I knew before, or maybe I know more because only 16 of them finished. How come? We simply increase the freaking logging level. Input output. Input output, exactly. Logging is I.O. So when your thread is doing when your virtual thread is doing IO in mounts and unmounts. Okay, so that means you want the jellies. Sorry. So it basically means when I go to this handle task, right? Previously, these were no op because I did this this fine log level was disabled, and now because I increased the logging level in here. Uh, like in here now they mean input output okay it's active so every time I hit this report or this logger find virtual thread and mounts and then again as I told you there is no guarantee right that I, you, I'll be given taxi to, to go back home or another another facility or something so this is you can see if you have more work to do then uh, then uh, then you can you can handle uh, then maybe virtual thread is, is not a good strategy for you because, as you can see, in the same six seconds, we limited throughput of the, uh, of the finished uh, tasks. Let me just... Could you, could you please put, disable once again this, this log level and run it? Okay. All right. So because because I've noticed that probably because of this this, this switching more tasks actually all of yes tasks. exactly exactly so that's what I wanted to show you is let's finally enable this proper uh, fine logging because normally console handler is not handling fine level okay so let's run it now and uh, now you can see see if if we had like if we drew it see there are step one for like many of them. Then there are sometimes we see step two, okay, there's like step three, but still we have new new tasks starting at step one and, and, and some with step two, and so this story goes, right? So it, you really have to have a lot of luck to be like virtual, uh, like this task uh, here for number 20, okay? So you always get a taxi to get you for five like uh, destinations, okay? Uh, there is one more thing. That's why only it was only one virtual thread or one task that was so lucky to get like a, a ride five times in a row. Okay, that's the whole trick. See, so this is like the the, the taxi company. It's called Fork Joint Pool. And one last thing. If I do both streams and virtual threads, how many tasks will be completed? Minus one. Minus one. No, it's not an option. Two. Okay. 
any higher than that. I can now switch to this like Texas with uh, bit. Logging with logging. Sixteen or seventeen? If only you have that two. Sixteen or seventeen. Yeah. What will be the order of starting? Uh, like, like. Do they reuse this function? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Let me let me get ready. Let me get ready. Uh, it's logging. It's working. It's a hard work. Okay. It's it's finished one here. But let's see. Sorry, uh, I should have like a lowercase. Uh, come on, maybe it's not didn't start. The, yeah. Sorry. Mm, you got that. I guess it's because my CPU cores were were like uh, busy. Let's let's try to run again. But this is the the the, the hint. Okay, I have. And now we can, you can see, now it's four, right? We can see that in these, uh, in these logs, okay? And that's the trick when I don't show both of them running, right? See, so this is common for uh, common pool, okay? For the parallel streams and for um, virtual threads, we have another pool, okay? So I have two pools, 15 and 15, because I have 16 cores, but I guess they basically got congested on the real, actual, physical, CPU cores, right? So that's why I have this. Jealous for you, sir. Okay, almost, almost late. Okay, perfect. Uh, so see, the, it's one of the one of the reasons I would say why we don't have this big switch, like to change the, to virtual threads globally, because you need to know what kind of tasks are you handling. All right, that's the, that depends on your business, on your actual code. That's why you should like give it a spin. Right in like in in uh, hopefully in testing environment in staging or I don't know like feature flags or something in production and see what's your throughput and what's your latency, okay? Because if your tasks are heavy uh, CPU tasks, right, and you also have this flip flop flip flop uh, because of the I/O, maybe virtual threads aren't solution for your for your pains, right? Maybe they won't give you more performance, okay? I mean, depends how you measure performance. If you want to see how many threads you can start or tasks you can start, so we started like a hell, hell lot of them, almost 120, right? But only four finished, okay? And it's because we have so much incoming traffic, okay? And, and the traffic is CPU heavy, not IO heavy. All right, very nice, yes. And for pinning, please go for, for this link. The slides are, if you don't see that, the slides are uh, online, the code is online, uh, only I'm here. Uh, yes, so structured concurrency. What is this structured concurrency? It's a preview feature. It, it was incubated twice, now it's a preview feature. Uh, and it might be about better idioms for multi-threaded code uh, because it's about thinking in synchronous way of subtasks. So we have a code that's quite synchronous or looks synchronous, but we can handle it, like divide it into like subtasks, sort of like uh, divide and, and conquer or divide and rule. Okay, so we divide our big chunk, uh, sorry, big task into smaller chunks like subtasks, and all these subtasks will be handled uh, at the same time using virtual threads, because what else, right? And therefore, we can get some help with eliminating uh, thread leaks. I mean, so you forget to like uh, stop a thread uh, because like you had like uh, some tasks working and you forgot to stop something, and it's pointless to wait. But because we had like you, you operated or, or handled your tasks manually, uh, some threads leaked because you, you forgot to stop them, right? And we also don't have cancellation delays. So when you know that it's done, everybody stops, right? There's no reason to, to do that. Uh, to, to keep waiting. And it's without touching current concurrency stuff. So nothing changes in executors, in futures, and completable futures, in thread, because of that, okay? It's something on top of this, something on top of virtual threads, using cancellation instead of uh, interruption. And yes, it's not replacing, for now, interruption with cancellation. We shall see in the future. Uh, and I have this uh, code example here for you. What does it do? I have this uh, structured task scope, new scope. I create new scope and I sign it here and try with resources because it's 
This way, it's, it's, it's automatically cleaned when I reach this end of this try block, right? And then in this scope, I can fork for subtasks. I can get more subtasks, okay? And let's say this is our task. We have like a big board and we have to display like the current status of the player, whatever they play, right? So we put like the name, score, name, score. And we have two microservices. One microservice can give us user IDs and names and the other can give us user IDs and the current score, okay? And then we have to ask this service, then we have to ask this service, right? Get results from both and combine the result or merge it, if you will, and then uh, like send the, the result, right? That's why you, uh, what you can see what I can do nicely and easily is this thing. I can like uh, fork uh, this task, I can fork this task or subtask to be precise, and these are subtasks now. These are no longer uh, futures. That, well, that's the change between Java 20 and Java 21, okay? And then I join this scope and I wait until all of them are successful or one of them fails. If at least one of them fails, then I have this beautiful mechanism of cancellation kicking in. And what it does, it basically calls every other subtask and it says, look, one of us failed. There's no reason for you to keep working, okay? Give up. Just give up. I mean, the, any further work is, is basically pointless. And therefore, we cancel every subtask, right? We leak no threads and so on. And we basically, if we have here this throw, if failed, we throw an exception. And we get like, uh, because we join here, uh, we have the results, uh, we have the names and the scores, and we can just combine them or do whatever we please. And there's a nice way, like I was also showing this, this uh, uh, or similar uh, code, let me go here for a structured concurrency demo. Yes, so as you can see, uh, instead of doing that sequentially, let's try to do that sequentially first. Uh, it takes two seconds because one call takes one second, more or less, the other takes one second. So the obvious way is to try to run them in parallel, right? And we want to go for a, uh, structured concurrency because what we want to achieve is this task cancellation, right? So now when we run it like this, we see one second and the same result, okay? But what we, we're interested like in this cancellation, see, for let's say getting these names fails, so I, I'm throwing just an exception uh, just to make, make things fun. And now because of the cancellation, just as I told you, so let me try to make this bigger, uh, when this guy uh, or this subtask fails, uh, this won't wait in this join, therefore what should be the execution time? More or less zero. Yes, exactly, we have no results, unless we've implemented this uh, task in an improper way, because what I'm doing here I'm, uh, I have this uh, sneaky sleep, okay? And what does sneaky sleep do? It's basically wrapping a, a thread sleep, and this is how I emulate this network round trip, okay? Don't do that at production. Don't do, even do that at home. It's demo only, okay? Whenever you have to write thread sleep in a production code, it's wrong. It's nine times out of, out of time, it's wrong, okay? You, when you have to wait for something, just wait for that thing, just don't, don't just sleep, okay? Because when you sleep, I mean, some other things might happen. And here, when we're interrupted, because this sleep, sleep as you can see, is interruptible, uh, this is how it works, okay? So therefore, this other task we're looking for the, for the uh, current scores can be interrupted, and therefore we have the execution type of zero. But let's say instead of having like thread sleep, we have certain piece of code which like is doing this hard work like we did in the previous example. So now the uh, execution time will be still one second despite not having the result. It's because this task is no longer reacting nicely when we try to cancel it. And how come? because this hard work, as you can see, is only doing like a CPU stuff, right? It's like doing some ugly math to, to keep our CPU busy for like uh, more or less this period of time. So what we need to do is every time we try to run it, 
let's say, I mean, this is like reading like a file line by line, okay? Or like processing DB results in like this result set if you have like pure old JDBC or something. Then every time you, you run it, you have to check if someone wanted to interrupt you, okay? Yes, as, as a task. And now when we try to run this, now it behaves correctly again. I mean, as we expected, see? So in order to benefit from structured concurrency, from these things, these subtasks being canceled or canceling each other, the thing in here has to be interruptible. If it's not, you just derail the whole purpose of structured concurrency. Okay, so don't do that at home, uh, if I may say so. Uh, right, roll back, roll back. Okay. Yes, so we have the free cancellation within this tree. And why we say the tree? Because this fork or this task can get reference to this scope and it can fork its own subtasks, okay? So uh, each task, it can start on fork on, this, on, the, on the scope it was started, more subtasks and more and more and more. And of course, you could, we could use another task, oh, sorry, another scope, but that would be pointless in this meaning that when we have a tree, okay, like starting from the very same root, and this is the, the root we have, then what we achieve is that whenever a single branch fails, the whole tree of tasks, or the whole flock as they call it, like stops or is cancelled, okay? Uh, so it's possible, like do it sort of like the, the matryoshka way, okay? Like a doll in a doll in a doll. Uh, so by default, we have two uh, tasks. So you know this, shutdown on failure, and there's another one, shadow on success. Success is understood, I have this task completed and there's no exception, right? So you have a result, for example, if you call the DB or external system. What you have got might be just rubbish, okay? So we need to make sure, if you, if you, if you don't consider the thing, the, the result uh, as a success, to, you, you need to make sure that you throw an exception. I'm not so sure if it's like a nice approach, but we have what we have. And when it's useful, uh, for, in the following example, we have a user ID, and let's say we have to translate this user ID into a username. And of course, we have all the usernames in our like, uh, like third-party system, okay? But the, the round trip is costly, so we have a cache, like a local cache, okay? And so instead of uh, like uh, asking our cache first, and then asking the external system, what we can do, we can start bo two subtasks, both subtasks at the same time. Ask the cache and ask the system. So whenever one of them returns, okay, then we have uh, the result. So when we had like a positive cache hit, we can cancel the, like, the, the query to the external system. And if we don't have, if we have a cache miss, okay, then we don't have to wait for, like until we discover that there was cache miss, we can already be like waiting for the result from uh, this uh, third party system, okay? This, like one of the scenarios when it might be useful. And don't forget to call join or join until, uh, even if you, if it, oh, sorry, even if you forget, you will be thrown an exception, you will face <coughs> an exception, so don't worry, I mean, uh, the, the, the API will take care of this, okay? Uh, one last thing is scope values. Uh, it's, uh, again, a preview feature after incubating. And it's a sort of one-way immutable thread locals, okay? Uh, with bounded lifetime, and this lifetime is visible in code. Just like you have a resource in try with resource, okay? You open a file, you open database connection, you open, like, whatever resource that's auto-closable, when you reach the end of this try, uh, try with resources block, right, it's freed, it's closed. And so is this scoped value. When you initialize it for a given block, its value is present in this block until the end of the block. And the block is visible in code. We'll get to that, all right? Uh, and this, therefore, it simplifies the reasoning. Because if we have thread local, and the, the threat is like, you know, like going round and round and round, like handling another task. If we forget to clean something in the thread local, right, another task might see what we have put in this thread local for the previous task. Okay, it's like going, like logging to your bank and seeing statements of like some other person. Because now your HTTP request is handled by a thread which previously was handling that other person, right? And the, the programmers forgotten to clean this thread local, so now you're working with the user ID, for example. 
Uh, and it also improves performance because it's like uh, because it's one way immutable, right? It can be shared for like any number of virtual threads because having like one million of virtual threads is nice, but if you use uh, thread local, which is possible with virtual threads, then it will be copied for every virtual thread. And if it's a read-only thing, what for? Okay, there's no point in that. So thread local doesn't change, doesn't get deprecated, uh, but be careful not to use thread local in millions of your virtual threads, okay? And how does it look like? Uh, let's say we have this uh, security clearance level, which is a uh, like new scope value, new instance of scope value, pretty much like thread local, right? And this is it, this is this variable. And then you see we put, this is the block, and we put where this, in this block, we assigned or set a value for this security clearance level, like to something, something coming from our request, from like a JWIT token, if you wish, if you wish right? Or, or, or like some other, I don't know, source of wisdom. And then whatever inside you just call get or else, I prefer or else before, because these look more le uh, like uh, the optional, okay? Uh, so instead of getting like null or something, I can have like a default, let's say, guest level. I can do stuff that's permitted. Uh, and if I've not permitted, I can like show an error or something like this. And again, we can nest them, right, the Matryoshka way. So in, 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 in this scope, I can nest uh, another st uh, scope value, like deeper, and when it makes sense, for example, I'm running, like I'm, I'm handling a business case scenario, so I said this is going to be my user, right, or like user privilege, uh, and then I'm calling like third-party service, and then I'm running some piece, like a, a logger, Okay, and the, the, the logic that puts something to, to logs doesn't need to know what's my uh, access level because log for shell, for example. Okay, so then I can nest another where and I can say where there's like no security clearance level, meaning you can do nothing. And then after I'm done logging, that inner scope will close, clean the thing, and back then I can, for example, write something to my message blocker broker using uh, the, the same security level I got here, okay? And then after I reach here, it's cleaned. It's, it's no more there. I have a very nice demo in code, but I won't show you it because time pressure, okay? So they work nicely with structured concurrency. They, they also work very beautiful in a single thread, okay? You can, like there's no reason for you to use them only in structured concurrency. In a single thread uh, use uh, scenarios, they also work very fine. Uh, and if you need to get a result, then you can't go for run with runnable, but call with callable, okay? Sort of makes sense. And these words can be nested just as I told you, okay? All righty, uh, so one hour passed, we just only finished concurrency and just going like this, zoop, uh, not very deeply. All right, but let's go for uh, processing data. Who's using records in production? Don't be shy, use records in production, come on, really. Very nice, more and more hands every time. So uh, if, if you're interested in records, they should be covered in like uh, Java 16 videos or something. Uh, however, the, the issue with Java is that current syntax or like pre-Java 21 syntax is not very welcoming if you need to process data because it looks like this. You get an object and you don't know what kind of object it is, you just got an object. Right? And then you need to check if it was an event. Right? So we go for, if, if, I, you, you want to check if this object was a, an event. And this is, mind you, Java 16 syntax, which means I can alias this thing. Right? So it's pattern matching for instance of. This is how it was called. If, I, if I'm running like Java 11, I can't even do this. I need to have another line with casting, okay? saying that event E is casted object. And only then I can check that the sum field in this event has this value m like matching certain criteria. And that, if that's the case, I can do something else. I'm doing something else if that's, of course, my event. <sighs> A lot of code, quite verbose to do like quite simple thing. Only if it's event that has a certain value in certain field, I want to do something. Okay, simple. So now we're going to have as a standard feature in Java 21, Pattern matching for switch. <coughs> and standard feature. Yes, as I said. And important part, gold or switch remains the same. So if you have like code lasting from Java 5, Java 7, Java 14, or whatever, 
it's still going to work the same way. Okay, You don't have to touch it anyhow. But this is the new syntax uh, that you can have. And maybe I shall show you that in, uh, in IDE because the coloring is better, because JavaScript plugin still doesn't know the, the syntax because the syntax has been released today. right? So this is the syntax. See, I get the, the version as an object to this get greeting, right? And uh, yes, I can switch. So first that you have noticed is this null, right? So I don't have to guard now this switch with a null because if it's null, I can just have a dedicated branch. And instead of null pointer exception, I can throw another exception because why not? And then I can try to match it or pattern match it against being an integer. And not only integer, I can also go and check, hey, I I'm only interested in integers which are at least 17. And then I say this is Java something something, right? And this is the thing. Uh, if, if it's an integer but not 17, like less than 17, then I can go for just an integer. And then I can go for default with oops, okay, if none of this is matched. Uh, if you're curious, like, uh, what, what do you think will be the result? Let's say I'm recruiting you and I'm running this on Java 21. What's the result? Come on. Yes. Let's see. Uh, I have a breakpoint. Uh, yes, this is Java 21. Exactly. Because we matched here. We passed this guard, right? Or we satisfied this guard. And this is Java 21. Very nice. I'm throwing you catching, okay? Let's... Like there's a camera, okay, like, ah, perfect, very nice, cool, uh, yeah, and there is like, a, I have a lengthy example, uh, like how this pattern matching works, but what's more important is this, uh, that switch can be now null friendly, as you've seen, it now handles objects, right, I'm switching over an object. Okay? It doesn't have to be an object, but like I'm using, I just went all in. Uh, not just primitives, enums, or strings, like before. Dominant cases aren't allowed by the compiler. What's the dominant case? The dominant case would be something like uh, this. See, it's not allowed by the compiler. And if you, if you think about it for like two seconds, one, to, it's obvious why it's impossible, right? Because if you've just matched against any integer, how on earth are we supposed to satisfy this branch condition? It's impossible, right? So that's why you see this in this example, this case uh, dominates, dominates, sorry, this case. That's why the, the code won't even compile, okay? So... It's more, more, more like I say with um, branching. Uh, so maybe. I, I, I don't want to go, go that deeply. Uh, cases can contain guards, as you've seen, because of this when and there's a condition, right? Uh, if you have sealed classes or sealed interfaces, they don't need default if you have a branch for every allowed subtype, right? That's one of the reasons of having sealed uh, classes. Pattern matching doesn't work with primitives. So it doesn't work with the lowercase ints, uh, like bytes uh, and whatnot, right? Uh, we can go for the big ones, like the autobox ones, but then we pay the performance penalty, so maybe it's not the best idea. Uh, because this pattern matching is also like nicer than chain of if else's, if else's, because if else's, what's the complexity of if else? It's, the, it's a linear one, right? You have to go usually like half of the depth to get a hit. Sometimes you get it like on top, sometimes you go like to the very bottom. There's of course like GTing and whatnot, but with this uh, s switch we have constant uh, complexity, right? Time complexity, because every time you're jumping just to like a proper branch. Uh, yes, uh, it works with enum labels since Java 21. That's one of the changes after um, incubation or preview feature. Uh, and it, it's working both for switch expressions and switch instruction, okay? So you, you, you're not doomed to use this uh, instruction style. So I see I'm returning something, so it's a, uh, sorry, it's expression then, with the expression. Uh, it, sorry? Expression and statement. No, 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 no. It's called explicitly called uh, expression. Anyway, it, does, it, it works in all cases, okay? That's, that's the message. And pattern matching doesn't all fall through. 
Okay, so say I, I, if I wanted to go something like uh, this, let's say uh, case uh, string like s and do something uh, like s because why not? Sorry, uh, like s. Come on. Of course, I can't use i here because i is not bound. Okay. Because it's not possible to go just here and that, like, it's always with the break, okay? I mean, it's always the break because it's like the, uh, this lambda style or arrow style, people call it. Uh, but even if I went for this, like, uh, case uh, something colon, it wouldn't work, right? Because uh, it, it also, it's like this uh, dominant cases. Like, if you think about it for two seconds, it's obvious it's impossible, like, logically. And yes. So it's nice, but then maybe you're using records, like you, you process your data as records, like you, you send data between like modules of your system or like subroutines or something as records. And then matching records uh, or using record patterns is nice because we can now, who's using uh, Scala? Finally. <laughs> okay, so in Scala we have case classes and case objects, right? And they have uh, generated for us the unapply method. And even if we have other objects uh, or classes, we can write the unapply method for ourselves to support this, to support the construction. Because what do I have here? I have a record of a value uh, which has like, a, yeah, this value is double. And then I have a complex, uh, which is, you can think of it like a, like a, like a point in, in, in two dimensions, okay? that it has like a real value and an imaginary value. This is like, a, you know, from, from university thing. And then I can match it. And then I can not only check if it's a value, like this type, but if it's a record, I can sort of deconstruct it. I can see what's inside, all right? Uh, so as you can see, I can go for and check if this is like value with, with like a, a V here. And then I can check if this is a complex of, of, uh, of like a double R packed in a value and double I packed in a value all together packed in a complex. And then the beauty of it is I can just call R and I here. Without record patterns, I would have to alias this complex as C, for example, and then call C dot uh, real dot uh, value. Right? And because of this sort of unpacking, I can basically go for R and I. And that's it. So it's, it's, it's a nicer way. Um, yes, they allow deconstructing records with nesting, as you've seen. Uh, and for now, there are no other types uh, that we can um, deconstruct. It works fine with ifs and switches. Uh, and if you want to play with it, like the, with the type system and whatnot, we should have it in, come on, come on, where are you? Not in concurrency, but in goodies, which is record patterns here. See, this is it. Uh, so it works with ifs, as you can see. And it also works with uh, switches, right? And I can also, of course, put uh, guards here. So when, uh, for example, R is bigger than I. Not that it's a wise idea to compare like uh, doubles this way, okay? But as you can see, we can now like get for like, a, let's say you're interested in a certain like a part of this like two dimensional uh, surface, right? Like this, this or whatever, then you can go simply like this. If you, if you care if it's also the uh, one of the uh, axes, then you can basically set it's equal and so on. So yeah, it's, it's, it's possible like this. Uh, yeah, and so if you if you're interested in this, I encourage you to play with this uh, with this demo. It's called Record Patterns Demo. Java, because we are jumping further. Uh, there are unnamed patterns and variables as well now as a per first preview, and I would say finally we're gonna use underscore because underscore got banned in Java nine, if you remember, right? If you don't, it still got banned. Right? It's not one, one of these Schrodinger cards. It's, it's always banned. Uh, yes. And sometimes when you take a look at the record, when you're matching this record against the pattern, you just care about, care about certain parts. Okay? Let's say in the previous example, we're only interested in the real part. 
we don't care about the imaginary part at all because reasons okay so then we can go like this for unnamed pattern or we have we can have unnamed pattern variable that means we care about the type but we don't care about the uh, the, the value right uh, this thing is like equivalent to var underscore basically uh, yeah and we can have like unnamed variable so this is an unnamed variable and that also works and this might get useful uh, in uh, where if you want to skip irrelevant parts parts of match records in for loops in catch in try with resources and uh, yeah let's let's go here for this demo uh, uh, yeah if, if you haven't noticed we still have some refreshments so if you want to grab something from the bar you're more than welcome to just go and like ask for something okay uh, let's see if this code runs okay it doesn't work illegal field name yes that's the point I don't know why I still don't know why it doesn't work with uh, with the latest maven I could found so what I have to I have to what I have to do is uh, let's go for this approach uh, it's uh, this thing let's let's try let going for this file and this file is in like hold on let me do it like this here uh, it's here and uh, let's open it in terminal and we're gonna go for a uh, Java of course enable preview uh, preview and now uh, unnamed patterns uh, right dot Java of course J Java okay and source yes of course and then source 21 and using the just Java it works I don't know why it doesn't work with Maven and therefore with the IDE okay I haven't figured it out I, I just wrote such a nasty code that it's syntactically okay preview feature in Java 21 but it brings Maven to its knees sorry uh, yes uh, so yeah I'm, I'm getting something 10 times and I'm, I'm only interested as you can see if this something is a positive complex number so I ignore the the imaginary part I only care about this real part and I check if this real is bigger than zero okay I need it to be positive and then I see uh, yes what did I get uh, yeah and then I check if it's a complex and if it's a positive true okay so this is how it works uh, I can of course uh, use var uh, sorry, not can you can you sorry I cannot use var as you can see I can go for like integer here and then I care that this thing is integer and this thing is uh, is like anything so uh, yeah so this unnamed pattern and then I can also like use it with ifs and instance of right I only care about uh, if it's this but then I like I'm not sure what's the what's the point of this I mean using this pattern matching with instance of and ignoring it but hey it's doable. Uh, and maybe that, that that was it that was causing this uh, problem with Maven. Uh, see, I can use, I can ignore. I don't have to put it like ignored, and then see my IDE like saying that it's ignored or my like uh, parcel analyzer. Like I can just go and say, this is now intended to ignore something. Okay, we get back the meaning to single underscore. Okay, as you can see, uh, this might happen. Uh, and do we have bad math? Uh, yes. See, so we went into this, so we cannot divide one by zero. It's still like impossible. Sorry, and I can also use that in lambdas. So I can have this useless comparator that like gives me a random thing every time I try to compare two <coughs> integers. Right. So this is bad code. In case it's recorded and someone doesn't speak English, I don't know. Bad code. One. Okay. Just don't do that. That's that's Why? that's ridiculous. I mean, it's a good code for your job safety, but nothing else. It's better than, than, than time source. Uh, maybe. Uh, let's not go into that direction. Okay. So I have this useless comparator, as you can see, and I, it also works, right? And I'll be using something called like uh, uh, sequence collections, but we have that later. So I'm creating like this so, so set and everything and everything. So I, as you can see, I can use that in lambdas as well. If I don't care, like what was the argument to my lambda, 
I don't care, therefore we just go for like, I ignore it. I ignore it in this useless comparator, and you shouldn't. And this even works as well, so we can use that in auto-closable. You just want to check if you can start something and you don't care about the thing. I'd say it's quite rare situation, but it's technically possible, okay? So we can use uh, custom auto-closable, yes, and just to prove it to you that it was called, you see it says this is custom closed in action, and it's there, so it got really closed, okay? So I wasn't cheating uh, here in this, in this piece of code. Where is it? Um, yes, this thing. And of course, instead of using this complicated thingy, we could go for like using this uh, positive complex for real. So as you can see, I can check now if this object is a complex that the real part is uh, greater than zero uh, in a single line, right? If you, if you really need to. So, yes. Okay, native stuff. Not much has changed in the a, in a native stuff. Uh, so why do we ca have like this, why do we have Project Panama in general? Because we have issues with this class called Sun Mist Can Save, because some people didn't read the manual, some people even didn't read the name of the class, and now they, when they get like exceptions or errors in their face, they, rel they, they learn it's unsafe to use, okay? Guess why? I don't know. So we want to have stuff that's safe in terms of time, range, and, and, and threats operating on our stuff. Now doing a, native, uh, a call to a native stuff can be tedious, right? Because we have to create all these tabs, uh, all these header files. We have to keep them in sync. I mean, the .h files with our Java code, and we need to compile them for both languages. Oh, a lot of work, okay? It's also limited, like sometimes, for example, like byte buffer. Good luck having more than two gigs of memory. Impossible because index out of range exception, right? You can't address more than two gigs. And of course, it can be slow at times. So we want performance that's not worse than JNIs. And I've read some reports a few, few weeks ago that the current state of art in, in Project Panama, uh, like they run benchmarks and stuff, said that they get, got like a two times better performance for certain scenarios of theirs. So as you can see, we should have not only this safety, as in here, not only this easy to use stuff, but it also most probably will be faster to use. So we have this long story it says third preview feature but previously it was like i don't know five times incubated so it was eight times like in the preview so for four years but the most probably i mean according to the rumors this thing will get finally standard feature in a java 22 so good stuff ahead of us and maybe I shouldn't be saying this, and I'm not into these language wars or not whatnot, but some say, take a look at the Python from a certain angle. What Python is? It's a wrapper around C. And in a way, Java will also become this easy wrapper around C, okay? So there are these building blocks that we have of, of foreign memory access, that we have memory segments, so this chunk of memory that starts here because it's the address and we have the layout so I know what kind of data I keep inside this uh, chunk of memory, right? For example, if I have structures, so I want to have like 10, like place for 10 structures and so on. And then I want to get like second element, right? And from that second structure, I want to get like a second field. And from that field, which is also a structure, I want to get like the uh, third field, which is uh, an integer. Then I also know if this integer is big endian or little endian, okay? So I don't have to calculate the bits and the offsets and whatnot and like cherry pick the memory and then process it. I can just say, give me that field of that layout and that's it, it's, it's delivered uh, like to me. I can use it in Java. And you, can, you might be wondering, why is this big fuss? Like, why do we have to have something around this memory? I mean, memory be memory, okay? The issue is, like, how, how do you allocate memory in C? Malloc, exactly. And where, when is it garbage collected? In free or when the program crashes, okay? Okay, so there are the two options, exactly. So in C, 
or C++ because they don't have garbage collectors. There is no concept of like, I have like a pointer to this structure or variable and now this funny guy comes called garbage collector and because it's compacting garbage collector, it's shifted it to somewhere else and I have to like adjust my pointers. Nonsense, right? That's why we need to keep it like a bridge and that's why it's a serious piece of engineering and that's why I think it took so long to do it right. And I'm happy that they're doing it right. And what we also have now is Arena, uh, and it works nice for, uh, for like try with resources. And we can also use var handles. Like var handles is like the good way of doing uh, reflection. Okay, like atomic reflection operations, something like this. And this is the code. So let's say I want to have off heap memory reserved for me for just ten integers, uh, for Java integers. I mean, so the proper layout is the like big Indian, little Indian, whatever. Right. So this is what I say. I want to have memory layout, that sequence layout of 10 elements, and each element is Java integer, and this is my integer layout. And then I open an arena. I say it's confined arena. So it's, if it's confined, it means only the thread that created this arena can play on this arena. No other thread, okay? No other thread. And then in this arena, I can allocate natively, you see, so off the hip, this layout, and I have it created for me, and then I can basically iterate over the elements in this uh, in this arena in this off heap memory and I can get uh, I can set something at a given index or get something as in here from uh, from given index right and so, as you can see the magic number 10 appears only here so then I have uh, like space safety okay because it's uh, like I get a start from 0 to, to 9 Okay, and I don't get like, uh, you know, off by one error because I, I'm kept here I by this element count. I also use it properly in time because I'm using it with try with resources. So when I get here, it will get closed. This memory will be freed. Okay, and also it, it's safe from the uh, thread point, uh, sorry, thread point of view because it's confined. Only this thread can handle it. So as you can see, it's, it's easy and nice way to handle native memory if you need. Right, and if that's really like a standard feature in Java 22, I'd be really happy. So, what does the, this Arena scope uh, do in that allocate native? What happens if we don't have this? Yeah. This thing, it's basically uh, they they change they're changing or they were changing API. Okay, so scope was introduced like version or two ago. Or vice versa. Arena was introduced a version of two ago, and it's still like needed basically a, like API. So Arena has its 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 scope sort of like from here to there, more or less. Like think of it this way. It might still change, so that's why I'm not like very devoted. I keep this example for like four years, and almost every time I have to update it because they change something. Another question. Can you combine the Arena with the, for example, scope values? So for, for example, put the Arena in scope value. Can I? put arena in a scope value. Um, I don't know, I wouldn't dare. I mean, at, last, at least right now, I mean, at, at this stage. It's, it, I guess it's, it's doable, uh, but uh, I mean, also like getting to back to virtual threads. Uh, one of the ways to pin virtual thread, I mean, it's calling IO inside synchronized stuff, and right now that pins virtual thread, right? Maybe in the future they will like find a way around it, so maybe in the future that it won't peel virtual threads, but native calls do yeah. pin virtual threads. And now, what's the point of having off heap memory? Usually to make a native call, that's the next slide, okay? So that's the, the, the reason why, I, I, mean, I mean, okay, like scope values and whatnot, I mean, I get you. I mean, if you wanna recruit someone in a nasty way, doable, but um, I, I smell like really few cases for this. Uh, so there are four arenas now, four default arenas. Another question. Yeah, what kind of scope? Uh, is it as, as hard as, let's say, uh, a summary of synchronicity? Or this thing? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I didn't benchmark it. It's, it's said it's to, to be faster than JNI. And the, the whole point is if you have, I mean, this is a naive example with just 10 elements, OK? Let's say you need to manage, like, I don't know, like uh, 20 gigs of memory. Okay, and if you need to manage it inside your heap, that would make your uh, garbage collector busy. And if you know exactly how you're going to use this memory, right? Because you, I don't know, you have you're writing, for example, like a super efficient cache, 
and you're gonna handle it like on your own and, and so on using this memory layouts and, and so on, right? Then it will be more efficient because you, you won't be like uh, putting pressure on garbage collector. So that I guess would be the, the use for just comparing it with the native, sorry, with the array of primitives. It's, it's just, I'm showing a, a demo here. By the way, uh, we can also allocate this or use uh, array of primitives as this uh, memory segment too. So memory segment doesn't have to be this segment, doesn't have to be always uh, native. It can also be like an array and other stuff, okay? So this thing is not always native memory. So sometimes you want to manage like other kinds of memory, including the on the hip memory. So we have four arenas now, global, uh, so many threads can access it and it can be closed. I mean, it's open through, I mean, as long as your process or program lives, it's open and, and many threads can go there and any thread can, can check this and, and whatnot. Uh, we have automatic arenas, again, uh, accessible by many threads, but these are closed by GC. So whenever the sort of like the handler to this arena is GC, GC also will free the arena that's pointed. Uh, we can have, as you've seen, confined arenas, so it's single thread and has bounded lifetime. So we either use it with the uh, try with resources or you cl call close manually. Oh, and, th and there's also shared uh, arena, which is just like, it has bounded lifetime, but it's for many threads and you can have your custom one. You can implement your own arena should you need to. Yeah. Uh, and where it can be used in this foreign linker API, which is also a preview feature, uh, again, replace JNI, uh, support for C in these architectures, but in the future it may ex be extended to C++ in, in, in 32 bits with C. Again, performance should be, shouldn't be worsened. And what Linker allows is this, making down calls and up calls. Making an up call is basically this, I and mean, down call is simple. You just, I'm saying, simple, simple. It's, it's not simple in terms of like engineering, but it's, it's simple to comprehend. You have like a function in C, you want to call this function in C from Java. So you need to tell Java, hey, this is the signature of this function, right? So this, these are the parameters, this is, this is the return type, uh, and just go down and call it for me, sort of. Uh, and you can do also like other thing, you can pass this C code, sort of let, let's say pointer to a, a function written in Java, so when we go to C code, this C code may again call something back in Java in our program, in our process, okay? So then it's called up call because it goes down and it goes up. And this is an example of a, of a, of a, of a down call. So first we go and read this manual, how to get user ID of the current user executing a process, okay? And at least in Linux. And we get native linker, we get uh, standard library, we look for the function called get UID. If it's not there, we just throw an exception, uh, but it should be there. Uh, you know, it's just to play things self. And then we sort of create like pass the signature. So we say that it's something that's going to return Java short. Uh, let's assume it's Java short and uh, we're not passing any arguments to invoke it. Okay. And then when I create this down call handle and I invoke this down call handle, Right? I get in return a short, okay? So I get UID of the current user running this stuff. And I have this example running, let's see, uh, it should be, where is this? For in this thing, uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, because what I want to do, what I want to avoid, I want to avoid, uh, right, for example, if that my stuff is run as root, okay? I don't want to be run as root. And yes, I have to go for, yes, okay. Uh, as you can see, uh, very nice warning that we called some stuff and whatnot. And we have a UID that's not roots. So it may say, oh, like developer's machine, it's, it's easy. Uh, but we can also go for like test containers, uh, right? And check how it will work, for example, in the production. So I can create an image like this. Uh, Java's and whatnot, and then when we call this thing, we can check if it's running as root or not. So very nice demo. I've already shown it, so not gonna spend more time. Uh, so you, you should run the test. I mean, this is good if you have Linux. If you don't have Linux, you go for, for the test, and this is how we play with the demo. Okay.
and we jump to another stuff, which is generational ZGC. ZGC, or Z, or Z, garbage collector, was introduced in Java as a standard feature in Java 15. And uh, if you don't know what the, that, there are two new, new garbage collectors in Java. One is called ZGC, another is called uh, Shenandoah. ZGC is done by Oracle folks or OpenGDK folks. Uh, Shenandoah is done uh, primarily, or used to be done, okay, shall I say, primarily by, by or sponsored by Red Hat, and they have the same purpose. When you have this global pause, when the garbage collector comes and shouts, everybody freeze, they want this pause to be tiny, okay? And current goal is one millisecond or less. So that's the, how, for how long the garbage collector should, should freeze your process. So for high frequency trading, it might be very useful, okay? Uh, so we don't have uh, like garbage collection pauses lasting, I don't know, tens or hundreds of milliseconds. We just have like one millisecond tops. And after introducing ZGC, they, they, they like also like uh, added a top of like improvements since Java 15. And now they're introducing the generation ZGC. Uh, sorry, it's experimental maybe, I don't know. Uh, uh, how does it work? It still keeps uh, pauses like up to one millisecond, but in theory, it should improve the performance of our uh, programs uh, and, and lower the, the memory overhead because garbage collector, fun fact, might need some, some data to garbage collect the other part of memory, right? So I, if I'm not mistaken, just from top of my head, uh, the memory overhead should be like 3% or something like this. And it should support heaps from hundreds of, of megabytes to 16 terabytes, because that's the maximum size of heap. And uh, they hope to improve these performance by dividing the heap into young and old uh, memory regions. So the, 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 the hypothesis that's working quite okay for many Java programs is this. Objects are born or allocated and then usually they ya die young, okay? They, they have very intensive uh, life as babies, and they die young, okay? And if they... they party sorry? I, I said they party hard. They, uh, they party hard. I don't know, maybe they party hard, or maybe it's like uh, in the medieval times. I don't know if it's a good metaphor, but let's say, what was the average uh, lifespan in, in here in this city, in Wroclaw, in like 1,200? Sorry? 18 years? Let's just, yeah, maybe 18, maybe 30, I don't know. But it's something around this, right? Like, uh, but does it mean that we didn't have people back then who were like, for example, 70 or 80 years old? We had such, uh, such uh, I mean, people so old. I mean, it's, it's, it's recorded, like we have that in records, right? So it doesn't mean everyone was dying at the age of 18 or 30, it's just, a lot of population was dying very young as infants, as babies, as children, because like diseases and whatnot, right, of starvation. And then after you made, made it to be an adult, chances of surviving like long enough to have your own offspring and then even become like a grandmother or grandfather were quite high, okay? So that's why this is like the, the theory behind these generations in garbage collectors. If you manage to reach like or survive the several like cycles of a garbage collector, you sort of adult, and now you can be like promoted or moved from the young generation to the old generation. And then the 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 thinking is this: young generation has to be checked more frequently than the old generation because youngsters or babies die much often than the the adult ones, right? So I don't have to pay that much attention to the adults. And that's it. So that's the, 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 the performance gain, okay? And yeah, and the idea is that there should be no manual configuration needed. So the thing should be auto-tuning, okay? Like when it's like the, the, the soft barrier and whatnot and, and so on and so on. Of course, like for every garbage collector, you have to set the maximum heap size, okay? That's the, like, it always makes sense. But beside that, I mean, there, there are some options and you're more than welcome to RTFM but in theory it shouldn't be needed, at least for most of us. And if you know or remember how uh, ZGC used to work, it, it used to have, how, how in general ZGC works? We have pointers, right? 
In a 64-bit machine, we have a, a pointers which are, fun fact, 64 bits long. And how much heap can we allocate? 16 terabytes. That means we can address this heap with 44 bytes, sorry, bits, which means we have 20 bits left, okay? And we can use these 20 bits for whatever we please. So ZGC, uh, like, the, like let's say classic one, was using four of these bits, as so-called colored bits, to point like if this is like the still valid uh, pointer or not or so on. Uh, it, has, it had some issues because they were like in the, in the front of the, of the like actual pointer pointer. Uh, some tools were, were sometimes seeing that we were, I mean, they weren't aware that we point using two pointers to the same area in memory. So they reported memory usage like as twice. And because there are four pointers and like weird circumstances, in, in, in worst case scenario, I was told they could even like see that you are using actually three times more memory, memory that you usually had in your computer. Okay, that was possible. So now they're not using four bits, now they use 12 bits. It's just now they're using, now they, sorry, they're not using bits that are ahead of actual pointer. They have the actual pointer and then they use 12 bits behind the actual pointer, okay? And because of like very sophisticated engineering and quite simple math, they like uh, run a compare and shift and whatnot. I mean, stuff around like what Yarek said two weeks ago. And therefore this thing gets like even improved, right? And uh, now they have load and store barriers. So basically these are like checks, okay? If I'm going to load this, this object or store this object, I need to check if this pointer is still valid, okay? Sort of oversimplification. And this is how you use it. You just not only go use ZGC, but you go for uh, Z, uh, Z generational. So this is how you enable it. And of course, maximum hip size. And it's quite likely that in the future the, the behavior will be flipped. So we'd have to enable this like classic ZGC and maybe the classic one will get removed. And I'm not gonna run this experiment. Uh, I was doing that for Java 15, but when I was doing it for Java 15, I have this nasty piece of code which, which, which is basically doing one thing, which we shouldn't be doing. It generates garbage, okay? It generates garbage. And then the question is how fast our garbage collectors can handle this garbage. So this is recording, like Java flight recording uh, from Java 15 using ZGC. Uh, see, it has like system properties, Java 15, okay? And uh, yeah, I was running like a program and what was the longest pause back then? If we go here and check, yeah, for the, uh, sorry, uh, this thing here, garbage collection, and uh, the longest pause was 1.14 milliseconds, okay? So that was the longest pause, like somewhere in here. And you can see like the heap utilization, so the garbage collector like figure out how, f how frequently it should run and so on. So you, you can see these are more frequent than these. So it was like some, some learning. It it's not the proper benchmark, okay? It's like basically a stupid, stupid garbage generator, but it can show us how, uh, how uh, garbage collectors can work. And this, this was ZGC in Java 15. Uh, at that time, G1 was uh, using, I mean, I've run the same, exactly the same code on the same machine, which was this machine. Uh, and then G1, which is a default one, the longest pause was uh, 113 milliseconds. So I would say two orders of magnitude more, okay? So if you, need, if you need to have shorter stop the world pauses, maybe you don't want to use G1, but uh, ZGC or Shenandoah, okay? Uh, for that reason. Of course, they will consume more CPU, uh, but it depends what, what your needs are. And then here comes the beauty of it. And that's why I say you should like be surfing this wave of Java. I don't know exactly why I didn't, or when I didn't pay attention, but I checked the resu results of ZGC for Java 21, and the longest pause was 27 microseconds. It's like, it's fast, right? It's damn fast, okay? So if you need to have short uh, garbage collection or like uh, stop the world pauses, as you can see, ZGC in Java 21 is your friend. It's your best friend, really. 
uh, because like it's, it's shifting like from milliseconds to tens of microseconds. It's it's amazing. On like a it's like a five year old machine. Come on, it's an ordinary PC. Uh, I also checked generational ZGC, and the result was slightly worse. And I think I know the explanation. And the explanation is, when I create a garbage, it's always in young generation, right? So there is no benefit, no possible benefit. And also, like, let's be serious, like three microseconds for quasi benchmark, it could have been just, you know, like a deviation, okay? So as you can see, ZGC or, or GC or, or Shenandoah in modern versions are your friends if you have to have short stop the world pauses, right? If you're into like a frequency, high frequency trading or whatever. Shenandoah? Sorry? I can, I can uh, yeah, for Java 15, that was, for Java 15, it was better. See, it was like a half a millisecond, basically. And for Java 21, it was uh, more or less the same. But it's not using like the, it's not the generational one, right? So, as you can see, and it's also, see, this one, it's, it's, it's the first one, it's the warm up, okay? So as you can see, it's like ridiculous. We should check one of these here. Uh, which are like, yeah, and these are, and not the longest one, but these are, as you can see, like a quarter of millisecond. So still like uh, quite impressive, I would say. Okay, so yeah. And of course, you should be uh, checking this using like in your production, right? You're running your, your real stuff, how is garbage collector working, like record, like do a Java file recording for like short period of time. And then it's like, you know, how, how, uh, how much you're spending in a, in a garbage collector. Okay, sequence collections. Uh, if we have Scala slash Kotlin slash Groovy slash Vavor users in the room, they're not going to be that much impressed. Uh, another JEP, what does it do? It basically means that, maybe I can show you here in this JEP if we open it and scroll a little bit. Yes. So these are the collections and maps, and now we have new interfaces here, right? So we have sequence collection, so a list is a sequence collection. We have sequence set, uh, so sorted set is a sequence set, and we have like sequence map as well, so sorted map or navigable map is, uh, or linked hash map are sequenced maps, okay? What does it do or what does it give us that we can yeah, in many collections we have a concept of sequence. So we have like linked something something. It's like FIFO. Like so, basically the the order of adding elements dictates like when the element will be stored. There, there's also like tree set, for example, where the sequence depends on like how the things are sorted, right? And of course the, the, the yeah, basically like a list. Like you add it, so it's always like added to, at the end. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, so basically, now we have methods like get first, add first, remove last, add last, and so on and so on, in these combinations, right? <coughs> sort of like head and reverse of the head or whatever. And if you want to reverse the collection, you can nicely get a view, just... O1 or ON? It depends on the implementation. And sometimes it's impossible, like you cannot add last to a tree set. Right, then it will throw you an exception. Uh, yeah, sequence collections. For example, get last. Depends on the on the implementation, right? Really, because if for the linked list, you have to iterate through all the elements, right? So it's just a convenient way of, of, of calling this. Uh, hold on, where am I? Here. So we should have like a C. Oh, gosh, where, where are these? Um, Maybe like this, this, oh, sequenced, yes, I have a nasty demo. So let's just demo collections. So as you can see, I am adding, uh, I have a sequ sequence collection, right? I get one of these uh, and I have CDE inside and then I add first, so I add B. So when I have C, D, E, and I add B as first, I'm going to add this element, right? And then I add as a first A, I'm going to add it here. And then I add F as last, it's going to be added here. 
and then when I call, uh, where is it? Uh, reversed, okay, I will get reversed collection like this thing. Okay, so it's like basically more APIs to like lists or something. If you need to, instead of getting get zero, we just can call like or get uh, the uh, collection size minus one. You can now just call get last and so on. Yeah, that, that's why I asked because, for example, in Dart, it's faster to, to call the last element, of course, in a, in a list. Just like, no, or our list. Yeah. Get, get last iterates of the list. Yeah, but that depends on implementation. And if we see that's a linked list in this example, we were lucky to get linked list. And if we get unmodifiable, uh, we get we we got like a set or something like a like a tree. Sorry, like a collection that's not modifiable, like a, uh, like this thing, right? Then of course it it will like we cannot add the the elements because it will throw us like a, cannot add elements, right? So then, and this is what. This is not like in Scala, for example, when by just by looking at the API, you know if the collection is modifiable or not, right? You will be you, you need to be prepared to call an exception, sorry, support uh, or catch an exception. So that's all to that, I guess. Not a big deal. Uh, yes, and these are like sequence collection set and map. These are links to uh, Chevadoc, and there's also, of course, if you have such a modifiable, sorry, if you have sequence collection, you can. Uh, have a, like an unmodified sequence collection as well, because why not? And now, string templates, okay? Whew, it's getting late. Uh, first preview feature in 21, and it might be one of the, uh, it might get used, useful for some people. Uh, you know this? Everybody knows this, right? Maybe this. So much easier to read, right? Especially with this, uh, like, uh, ternary operation. Uh, yes, and some people say, but my language can already do that, right? In Kotlin, in Scala, in, in Perl, in JavaScript, in Python, in PHP. I mean, in, in, there, there are a lot of languages already supporting this. But there's a slight tiny issue with this mechanism. Yes, uh, code injection, SQL injection, all kind of nasty injections might happen, right? Uh, so the, the, the Java's way is going to be, most probably, to have something like this without that risk. And how can it be done? Using string templates. So now we have Java Lang string template str imported to every sort of to every source file, like public static field. So we can just go and call str, basically. Um, and it works like this. Let me just open it in IDE. I mean, IDE is obviously better. Um, yes. So you see, I have this. First name, last name, middle name. Uh, when I was born, or that person to, for, for that record. And using text blocks introduced in Java 15, I can go like this. So instead of having dollar, I'm going to have a backslash in Polish, uh, yes, this is how I was taught at university. That was the name. Yeah, uh, really <laughs> that joke. Yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, let, maybe, maybe we shall run it. Maybe we shall run it. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is the, the result. See? Uh, so I don't have to use this plus, I don't have to append, I can just go for first name, middle name, last name. Uh, see, I can have like expressions in here, just when I'm born, okay? And, and, and like uh, some other things, so it's duration, basically. And just it's, it's here just to prove that it's not like pre-compiled or something. You see when it's running again, it's, this number has changed, right? <laughs> Is there actually a space between str dot and the and those uh, and the strings? Not anymore. <laughs> it's because we'll get to that. Okay, I promise. In in case I forget, you you tell me. Uh, which battery is low? These laptops? 
Oh, come on. I didn't connect it. Ooh, ah. Okay, 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 okay. That would be, okay. Yeah, our batteries are also low, but see, this is like a beefy release. I'm really doing, like, we skipped a lot of stuff, okay? And this, this is what happens. Sorry. Yes. So, and we've printed it. And as you can see, we can, uh, yeah, we can go deeper like this and we can go like also deeper and I can go have like deeper, like deeper and then deeper. So I can have string template inside string template in case I really need to. Uh, yes, this might get useful for like creating JSON. Not YAML, okay? No, no, no. Okay, YAML would work as well, but... Fastless looks pretty well if you would like to blow the dynamic regular expression. We'll get to that, we'll get to that, yes. Uh, and there's another processor. Okay, let, let's go back to slides. Uh, so it consists of fragments and values, okay? Uh, support, supports nesting, just sort of static values and dynamic expressions, and we can call interpolate on a string template or maybe better use str, which is, which is interpolated by default. All right, but how, how does state us, you know, uh, from, from this SQL injection? Because we'll get to that, right. okay? And then we have process, uh, uh, that, so we can, we can like turn a string template into result using this processor, and then we can also have our own processors because there are three pre-default ones. Default ones. This is str that's interpolated like instantly, right? When you create it, there's a raw one, so we can build it and interpolate it later. And this s, there's also fmt, which works basically like printf or formatter. Okay. And the idea is we will have, for example, SQL processor that will look for, for example, a single ampersand and then escape it for us. That's the idea. That's the like. Uh, it's not present here, but it might be, for example, that JDBC drivers will provide that with such a processor, right? So then we we'll just import such a thing because str, it's always imported. See, I don't have str import uh, anyway here, but uh, I can also use uh, this row one, which is not, uh, I didn't decide, I didn't import it, I just used fully qualified name. Okay, so, so this uh, SQL template uh, will take a template looking for the fragments that are included into this template and values to be precise Va values and yes then they replace them to the in example uh, to that statement with the value for example yes, yes. okay looks looks promising uh so this is why is, is it working like it's like it should or not i don't know let's see uh maybe it's maybe it is maybe it isn't i don't know Yes, uh, there's something uh, something uh, wrong. I guess I should have moved that. Uh, I create a new template in here. Sorry, like here because I'm not doing this. Uh, see, but this this is maybe a good example. So how things are like bound and whatnot. I created X and Epsilon and I created the row string example. And here we can see the fragments. So the fragments are like, the, the, at least you have two fragments, the beginning and the end. And then you have everything in between. So for this, this is my first fragment, then this is another one, uh, then this is another one, and then I have the one that ends, right? So I have one, two, three, four, exactly. And then I have values which are in between. So this is a value, this is a value, and this is a value. And even for a row processor, it got bound, okay? Uh, so bound like uh it's like it's let's say it's fixed here in this string template so even if i here try to uh call it or interpolate it it will still have the same values despite x and uh, epsilon have changed or x and y okay so the the way for this is to go sorry like i should paste it here sorry wrong place again touchpad interferes uh when i overwrite it here because i want to get these new values then I have like a basic math, okay? See, so it's, it's, it's changing like this. Uh, and what we can do, the nasty thing we can do, is like create sort of our DSL. And I was thinking earlier today if it's external or internal, and it's, it's too late for me to debate on this. 
Uh, so what I want to do basically is have it something like this. This is my piece of code and this is my basic math processor. I created my own processor just as if we could create, for example, like a SQL or, or JavaScript or whatever, or Rust, of course, any Rust people in the room? Okay, there, there's always this Rust guy. Okay, um, it can be anyone, not just you. Uh, yeah, so we can say it's 12 add seven, and therefore 17 subtract seven, and this is it, right? And moreover, if I multiply two by three, and of course three multiply two, what else have you expected? And let's run this piece of code. And this is the result. I didn't use 17, right? I just said this, this, this. And I can create this. See, I, I've used like, uh, uh, I used records, uh, right? So I create record for a multiplication operation, for a summary, for a subtraction, right? And these are, of course, integers. And like, I don't know if we should go that much further. It's more for fun, okay? Uh, basically, I have this basic math processor, which is string template processor off, and here I pass the lambda, so I get string template, and then I check. If the number of values is not divisible or dividable by, uh, by three, then I throw expected simple math operations only. So I can't go like, uh, like this. Kaboom, right? So if you need to rewrite Spock, you can do that. Maybe like this, I don't know. Um, and then, then I, I'm using string builder and fragments iterator. So then I'm iterating over the fragments and the values, and then I check which element that is, if that's uh, this, this element or this element. If it's the, the second element, I mean, I've, I've acu sort of accumulated everything. Then I run this, uh, then I run uh, this part, uh, then when I add, this and, and apply the result. See, I have fragments iterator, so I get the first fragment, so something that's like the moreover, let's say, for this line. Then I append n1, which is two. Then I append next fragment, which is times. Then I append, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, which is this uh, operation representation, because I, I had here, I have like multiply. So I have it from here. And then I add another fragment, which is, uh, this thing, if I'm not mistaken, then it's another value, which is three, and then I add equals and, and the result, right, which are absent here. So as you can see, I can do like a lot. If it makes sense, I'm not so sure, but it's possible, uh, right? It's, it's doable. Uh, yes, so it's like this. Uh, and of course, the, uh, yeah, the FMT, do I have FMT? Uh, I have, yeah, I have FMT, you see, so I can format, for example, get me just the year of this person, right? So then I say it's temporal field in its year, and then I know, like, I get basically a uh, zoned uh, date, uh, and I get, like, year from, from that uh, object. Yes, and we can create our own processors. Uh, one of the last things, unnamed classes and instance main methods, and a bootcamp people. Have you been to bootcamp before you became developer? It's, 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 it's not shameful, right? Really. Or have you been a bootcamp teacher? <coughs> or maybe last question. Was Java your first programming language? There we are. There we are. Exactly. And then, if we have something like this, and Java is your first programming language, then you have to trust your teacher that you have to put public, or maybe not public, but you for sure have to put class, and this, th then like a name, which is like a valid class name. And then you have to go for like public, and static, and void, and main, and string, and square, squ like this square brackets, or dot, 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 and then you go for ax, and then finally you can start coding. Lot of ceremony if you want to start, okay? How about this? sort of nicer, I would say, okay? So we have the concept of unnamed classes. So here in this code, I have unnamed class. And as you can see, because it's not static, it's an instance main method. And it even, even doesn't have string arguments because these aren't, these aren't needed anymore, okay? 
yeah, so this can be omitted. Main doesn't have to be public or static. Uh, and there's an order of, of things. And they also work with interpreter, just what I've shown you with this record pattern. So we can co call Java and then just source file. And to some degree, it works with scripts. And also today on the release stream, uh, they show the new tool. I mean, yeah. I'm not sure how new this is. But on the page dev.java, there is a playground when you, where you don't need to even use the main class or... Yeah, but it... Ha it I guess it's like uh, it's, it's it has yeah. to be wrapped or like you something. Don't need to have Java or so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To to yeah, exactly. So this is the code that we are used to, right? Uh, public void, uh, public static void main, main, right? And I can go like instead of this, as you can see, I can skip the arguments. I can uh, I can skip the static. Let's say I, I want to go for this. I want to have public void main, right? Kaboom! Let's run this. Uh, right, and let's say I want to have uh, this and the 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 gold odd one, and then I run this again. <coughs> See, there is the order of things, right? So if we have, if I happen to have two methods named the main, one without arguments, one with these strings, then of course this will be sort of uh, selected first. Okay. Could you switch uh, the, the order? What happens if this the the, the, the simplified thing? Oh, so it's not the order, it's about... No, no, no. It's not the order of like where it's in the source file. It's like the order of the model that says this order. First, it's checked if, if there's like string arguments over none, a static over instance, and public over default. Right. Okay? Or non-public, shall I say. This is the order, not like order in the, in the source code uh, file. Right? And so we can go as deep as this. So as you can see, I have just void main. Um, Yes, and let's try to run it. Okay, uh, so yeah, I'm just checking for a bunch of stuff. Uh, so it's, of course, I have like a class, okay? I have a class, so it's not unnamed file uh, or unnamed class. But I can go see here, I have this no class, and IntelliJ is complaining because this is all I have in my file. So I can go for... Uh, Java dash dash enable preview dash source exactly becomes like Python yeah uh, and then it's uh, what is it with semicolons, with semicolons yes uh, it's called no class sorry oh I'm in the wrong uh, sorry I'm in the wrong directory uh, no this one not this one not this one yes Java enable enable preview source 21 no class Java perfect dream of all socialists and communism no classes anymore yeah. classless society or maybe that wasn't a dream I don't know I'm not good in, in politics sorry yeah so when we run this as you can see and this is a funny thing right uh, we have an uh, instance main method uh, called, okay, in unnamed class without arguments, obviously. The class is, not, is the class unnamed? I'm asking this get class. Are you unnamed? Yes, I don't have a name. I'm unnamed class. Okay, so what is your name? And my name is no class. <laughs> because the, this is an implementation detail. I wouldn't rely on this, but they infer the name of the class from this from name of this file, okay? Change the name of the file. I, I knew someone will do that. I knew, okay, let's do like 12, oh, 21. 21 because it's 21, okay? Java 21. Let's go now and call 21. Yes, bad file name. Because of the implementation detail, we can't infer the, so see this, like this is a named class with a specified name. Okay, I had a sort of like mind melting experience, but this is what it is. How about if you type one letter before it? Uh, yes, if I if I put like uh, like this, yeah, and then we go for uh, Java twenty one. Yeah, it works. And there's more fun. 
because in Java you can now write scripts, which means JavaScript, <laughs> in a way. I mean now, since Java 9, okay? And this is, as you can see, it's check script, okay? And it's a file, let's go, let's list it. It's a file that's executable one, okay? So I can execute it, and I can go for a check script, et voila, this is JavaScript, right? Yeah. Really, it's, a, it's old stuff, it's like Java 9, really. Uh, Maybe we will cut this part. No, 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 no. Yeah. This is the best thing that could happen, because the recognition from me that people will get a heart attack when they see that, because that means applets can back. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, so the change in Java 21 is, this, was, this would work in Java 9 as well. It's just in Java 21, we would need public, static, blah, 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 everything right now. The thing is, let's say I've, I tried to uh, comment this out. So again, uh, socialism in full swing, no classes, right? And now let me try to check script. And again, bad file name, check script. So from check script, it can, because it can only infer, the interpreter here can only infer the name of this unnamed class if the file name ends with .java. Else it's hopeless. So see, that's why I, I, I called it catch22. So we can have, um, yeah, and then it's of course, then, of course, it's not a named class because then the class is named, right? So it's, it's as you can see, um, the class is not unnamed, which means it's, it's like proper, properly named class. Uh, yeah, but th this is correct because you need to interpret hard at the first line. So if it says Java, Java file. In the, yeah, I, 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 can't have, I can't have Shebang in, in the Java file. So it would be, if we want to really go like, like all in, I would say we would get rid of this implementation detail and the name of the class would have to be like random, random, okay? Or like inaccessible, throwing like, I don't know, um, no class name exception, whatever. Yeah, that makes sense if you have methods that can check it, that it has or not. Uh, exactly, exactly. But I mean, we shall see. Uh, that means you can subscribe to Amber's, uh, I mean, Amber, the, the, the mailing list of Project Amber and complain there, okay? Uh, my struggle is done. Uh, one last thing, I hope, is Java Flight Recorder View. Who's using Java Flight Recorder? Yarek is not here. Okay, how do you use it? Because before Java 21, there are two ways, maybe three ways of using Java Flight Recorder. Nice profiler. Yeah, but, but how, 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 do you, how do you use Java Flight Recorder? Let's say your boss say, comes and says, uh, they say, uh, you should be using Java Flight Recorder. And what do you do then? Fetch the persistent code. Simple way. Yeah, so there are these like, two, two and a half options. Well, option number one is uh, ju just add this, uh, like, dash x something, like, enable recording, right? And then when, when your Java process is running, it's just recording to the file. That's one way. Another way is to go JCMD start recording, stop recording, and dump it to a file, okay? So this, this, and this is like how Java Mission Control is also doing, attaching to the, so you can attach to the, to the process, tell it to record like certain piece of like, uh, of the journey of the flight, and you have a file to analyze it. Since Java 14, there's another mechanism which is called streaming, so we can attach an agent or start it like upfront that the events will be streamed, so we can like, uh, like uh, process these events in another uh, thing. And now there's yet another option, which is Java Flight Recorder View standard feature. It's not a JEP, it's just a small feature. And what does it do? What does it do? We no longer need to dump this file or use Java uh, Mission Control. Uh, we just go like this. Let me, um, that's why I have this breakpoint. Let me demonstrate it for you. So you, you, we just use, you can use this new, sorry, we can use this, uh, come on. Uh, Java Flight Recorder view command for JCMD or JFR view if you happen to have this file. If you have the file, then you can, instead of using Java Mission Control, you can call this JFR uh, view, like over SSH or in like a terminal or whatever. Uh, how does it work? Uh, let me go for this uh, app. I have an app. And let me put a breakpoint here. Okay, it's there. Uh, let's try to run it. Will it run? Yes. Okay, it finished. Why did it finish? 
OK, I'm running wrong things. Sorry. Uh, this thing. Yeah, OK. And now let's go for uh, let's go for JCMD. So I should have, where is it? Uh, and this is my app, OK? So this is its speed. So I go for JCMD, PID. Oh, come on. JCMD, and the PID is 44229. And now it shows me all the commands I can send using uh, uh, J, uh, JCMD, right? And one of these, and this is a new thing, is this Java Flight Recorder view, OK? So I can go uh, Java Flight Recorder uh, view, sorry, uh, view. And you can see, it, it, like, I didn't specify what I want to see. So I, let's say I want to see uh, GC. No recording available because I didn't start it. Makes sense. So I have to go JF, Java Flight Recording Start. Sorry, Start. And now let's go View GC. There were no events of garbage collection when, since I started recording. Makes sense because that process is just waiting for this breakpoint. OK, so let me go for just all events. Maybe let's let's do it like this. Clean and um, all events. Kaboom. So now, if you know what you're looking for, instead of analyzing an offline Java flight recording file, like in here, like we did, OK, you can go for uh, see various things that you can see, just, just like a sneak peek, whatever you, 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 you want to select using this command, uh, more or less like this. And you select like the event, and you can go for like the width, like set the formatting, like what's the width of the, of the column and whatnot. So I, I guess Krzysztof Szlusarski will be super happy to script over this. Um, yes. Uh, so this is what we have. OK, various stuff. There are changes to other changes to garbage collection collectors as well. There's a link for you. A follow for like for this. Uh, it's not my blog. It's a great guy. Uh, sorry, great person doing this. Uh, that, there's a list of fixed issues. And the leaks, like what did they fix in Java? Come on, do I still have Wi-Fi? Uh, maybe I don't. Or maybe something broke. I don't know. The, the list is like several screens long, basically. That's also the reason why it should be like maybe surfing the wave because more and more things get, get fixed. Uh, there's, of course, vector API in sixth uh, incubator. Uh, I'm not covering this. Rumors, rumor has it they're waiting for Valhalla. Maybe that's true. Uh, there's key encapsulation mechanism API. Basically, I mean, long story short and, and tremendously oversimplified. If you have a symmetric key, you can keep it safe using asymmetric key. Sort of. Wrapping, I mean, Matryoshka doll style, whatnot. Some stuff got deprecated, like uh, Windows 10 is the last Windows supporting 32 bits. And Microsoft says, if I'm not mistaken, they stopped supporting it sometime in 2025. So we're already preparing to stop supporting that build of Java. Okay. Uh, we also prepare to disallow uh, the dynamic loading of agents. Now it will just issue you a warning. So when you run your Mokito tests, you may get a warning. Uh, it is basically uh, like the long story short, it's about safety. So when you start your process, suddenly someone doesn't attach an agent that can not only read anything in this process, but also can alter like uh, insert malicious code or whatnot, right? Uh, yes. Um, dear people, please remember, always, for every meetup, Java, no Java, conference talk or whatnot. I know it was quite lengthy, but come on, this was the beefy release. Please provide your feedback in any form. I can even accept paper forms, uh, right? Uh, I won't accept beers because I'm driving today, but feedback in any form is welcome, especially like if you decide to go and fill this little survey, it's anonymous. And if you're watching us on YouTube, you should do two things. Even if you're watching this like months later, you should follow this survey and hit the subscribe button. Um, yes. Uh, that's almost this. Uh, if you want to follow me on social media for like, I don't know, uh, IT insights, more Java fun stuff, or basically pure poor life advices, uh, you, you're more than welcome to do so. Uh, and now this is the time for this embarrassing product placement. As you've seen, it was very rapid, okay? 
and I do workshops like for like day or two days or even longer, like workshops, training session or whatnot. So if you'd like to have like a like you, someone you you know, like someone like in your company, I don't know, uh, because you have issues migrating to a new Java version or something, you're more than welcome to to contact me and we can like agree on the terms and and I can do like a such a workshop session for you, uh, for your company. Um, if you if you want to get anything that was like today, this is it. This is the ultimate link. This is the link to the slide, to the code, to everything, to this presentation. Uh, people still taking pictures. Okay. This is it. Dziękuję bardzo.